Hi, I'm Beth. I'm an educator at the National Air and Space Museum. And I'm Marty. We host an Emmy-nominated TV show for middle school students produced by the museum called STEM in 30. And I'm Christopher Williams, STEM educator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. In just a short while, we are going to be talking live to NASA astronaut Victor Glover, who is currently on the International Space Station. This connection is called a downlink, and he will be answering questions from students all across the country. So let us know where you're watching from and what school you're with by placing your information in the comment section on the Facebook page, because we will be giving shout outs throughout the program. Marty and I have gotten a chance to talk to the International Space Station before. We talked with uh, Randy Comrade Bresnik and also uh, Serena Anyan Chancellor during these downlinks, which is a lot of fun. But just like NASA, crews tend to have veteran astronauts and rookies. And that is just like our crew today. Like Beth said, we've done this a couple of times and Chris is our outstanding rookie on this team. Just like Marty said, this is my first time participating in the downlink with the ISS, and I am grateful to be working with such an experienced team. Now, on any team, its members bring together different knowledge and skills to ensure that their mission is a success. Victor Glover is participating in his first space flight and is relying on his fellow astronauts and teammates to help him make the most of his time on the ISS. Now, even with his teammates representing different countries and different cultures, they still work together to ensure that each task is completed and that the overall mission is a success. Chris, we're getting ready to talk to the International Space Station. Your first time, how are you feeling? I am excited and ready. We have been extremely lucky at the Smithsonian that Victor Glover chose to collaborate with not one, but two of the museums. Let's learn a little bit more about this collaboration from Victor Glover himself. Check this out. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Victor Glover. I travel to the International Space Station as the pilot of SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft, and I invite you to follow along on our journey. I have always been a part of a team. Whether it was my time on the college wrestling and football teams at Cal Poly, or during my time in the Navy, working together as a team and supporting one another allows us to be better, to go further, and accomplish more than we could do alone. I'm traveling with fellow NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins and Shannon Walker and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi. We'll be part of Expedition 64, where we will live aboard the International Space Station for several months. While there, we will work as a team to complete science experiments, spacewalks, and to keep the space station clean and safe. All of these tasks are important to have a safe and successful mission. Our team is not limited to those aboard the space station. We will work with a team of scientists and engineers, as well as mission control all over the world. They will protect and guide us from the ground and support the science and other activities while we're in orbit and during our return to Earth. I will also be joining forces with two Smithsonian museums, the National Air and Space Museum and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. The museums will be helping us in space to keep in touch with all of you during our stay on the space station. I will be taking questions aboard the space station from students like you about what my time in space is like during an event with the Smithsonian. And while I'm in space, I want you to be involved and to become a part of our team. I believe that the same teamwork used by us at NASA to investigate extreme weather and to help unlock the secrets of the universe can be used to solve our most pressing issues here on Earth. If we hope to solve humanity's most important problems, we must work together. We need each other. Just as our society today is built on the work done in the past by people like Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, Fannie Lou Hamer, John Lewis, and many others, our mission builds on the work of other astronauts, engineers, and scientists that have come before us, including Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, Dorothy Vaughn, Charlie Bolden, Alvin Drew, and Mae Jemison. They and many others have paved the way for us to work and live in space. We hope to continue their legacy. We ask that you join us in our commitment to excellence, teamwork, and communication. All teams need diverse members in terms of their backgrounds, skill sets, and ways of thinking. So I'm asking all of you to come together to complete a project about teamwork. I want you to show me what teamwork looks like in your life. Whether it's on a sports team, at your school, or in your community. But I want you to do it through art. The arts allow us to uniquely express ourselves and to connect with one another 
in new and exciting ways. Coming together through the arts can help us to create a better and more beautiful world. It will take all of us exploring, learning, and sharing to create a better future for humanity. Let's explore together. We have schools watching from all over the country, and I'm gonna start the shout outs by recognizing the school from my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. First up is the historic Cherry Hill Elementary School from Baltimore City. Next, we have Mission Road Elementary from Cartersville, Georgia. Moving on to Westwood Neighborhood School. And then lastly for me, we have Liberty Elementary in South Riding, Virginia. I hope all of the students and schools that are watching are enjoying the program. We were lucky enough to work with Victor shortly after he was chosen as an astronaut candidate in 2013. And in fact, his class was introduced to the public at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. While Victor was in the museum, we filmed a short video with him called My Path. These videos are where we talk to really cool people about how they got to where they are. Now, Victor did not start out as an astronaut. He was a fighter pilot before that, and before that, he had a job that, well, it's not quite as glamorous. So as you watch this video, pay very close attention to what some of his first jobs were. And also, we want you to really listen to what he says about failure, because Victor Glover, as successful as he is, has failed a lot. So let's head over to Victor to learn a little more about his path to becoming an astronaut. Hello, I'm NASA astronaut Victor Glover, and I'm a part of the 2013 astronaut class, and I'm here with you today at the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. I went to Cal Poly on a wrestling scholarship and wrestled and played football there for a couple of years, and I graduated with a degree in general engineering, and while I was at Cal Poly, I joined the Navy and I didn't know if I wanted to be a Navy SEAL or a pilot, but I wanted to do something adventurous that captured that team spirit, that high performance mindset. And I wound up going to flight school and becoming an F-18 pilot and test pilot. And while in the Navy, I've been able to go to graduate school a few times and, and further my technical education uh, as well. If you remember uh, uh, an entity called 7-Eleven, and I used to stock the cooler, so it was cold, it was cold in there. I, I worked at a Kentucky Fried Chicken. I worked at KFC Frying Chicken. I did that for a, a summer in high school. And then when I was in college, I spent every summer doing something. And one of the things I did the most in college was tutor for a program called MESA, Mathematics, Engineering, and Science Achievement. And I would do outreach and, and tutoring for, the, for uh, high school and middle school students. Fifth grade, I had a, a teacher, Mr. Hargrove, who, who told me, you know, if you work hard, you will be a great engineer. And, and I have to admit, in fifth grade, I thought that meant driving trains, but it was his belief in me and setting that standard that he lit a fire that, that burns bright to this day. And um, I, I went to college and studied engineering because of what he said to me in fifth grade. Be a lifelong learner and be a good person. Look for challenges. Go out and seek those hard things. Learn a foreign language. Learn to computer program. Learn to go out and do hard things. For example, if giving speeches makes you nervous, you ought to be standing up here right next to me. Start off just like in the gym. You don't go to the gym and put 300 pounds on the bar and try to lift it. You put 10, then 20, and you work your way up. Stand in the mirror and make a speech. Then make a speech in front of your brother and sister. And then make a speech in front of your mom and dad. And then your teacher. And then your classroom. And before you know it, you'll be making an address on the mall like the president at the inauguration. And you won't be nervous. Or at least that nervous energy, you'll be able to funnel it. Extremely important. You know, one of the things you learn working around a bunch of engineers is how important it is to be able to communicate. You could have the greatest design. This is gonna solve these amazing problems, but if you can't communicate that, you may be the designer, but the folks who have to build it need to understand what's in your head. And that's what communication is. So it's extremely important to be able to communicate. And just like you practice football, just like you draft and you practice uh, math and you practice computer programming, you have to do it in order to do it well. Communication, written and verbal, are things that you have to practice as well. It's interesting, you show up in this flight suit, you know, with, with that title, that job title, 
and people say, hell, you're smart and they think about success. But I can tell you, most folks that have that title and wear this uniform have probably failed at more things. I have failed at more things than your average person. And so you're going to find something in this line of work or anything in life, anything you really try to step out there and do. Uh, you need to step out on faith because at some point you're going to find challenges, but they're not there for us to turn away from. Those are where we get better. You go to the gym, you put weight on the bar. You put resistance because that's what makes you strong. We have a lot of schools watching the downlink right now. We'd like to recognize some of them. Hightower Trail Elementary, Richard Allen Preparatory Charter School, Maryland International School in Elkridge, Maryland, Star Point Middle School and Fracano Elementary School in Lockport, New York. If you're watching, let us know in the comment section and we'll try and give you a shout out as well. I also wanna let you all know about another activity that we have for you. It's an art activity that is inspired by Victor Glover and created by an art educator from the National Museum of African American History and Culture by the name of Rachel Sciampoli. Now in this art activity, we want all of you to create art that shows us what teamwork looks like in your lives. Whether your team consists of friends, family, or even a pet, show us how you work together to accomplish the missions that matter the most to you. You can draw on inspiration from a lot of different sources. Before I became an educator at the National Air and Space Museum, I was actually a working artist. And today I draw from a lot of space sources. Uh, some inspiration I have found is while we were doing work on exoplanets and that became a creative art piece for me. And I've also taken images of Jupiter from the Juno missions to create artwork as well. So look for those inspirations and put them into your art. I have always been fascinated by spray paint art of crazy, fantastic worlds. So about a year ago, I taught myself to do spray paint art. It is a lot of fun, and I think I keep getting a little bit better, but I'm always trying new things, and it's always fun. And I've spent the last eight months becoming really, really familiar with the art of my two-year-old twins. I encourage them to be as creative as they can with their use of colors, shapes, and squiggles. And the best part about all of it is that we get to get our walls decorated for free. As we mentioned earlier, Victor has teamed up with both museums so students can follow along on his mission and participate by creating artwork around that theme of teamwork. Check this out. I am here with my colleague and fellow educator, Rachel Sciampoli, to share the importance of teamwork in our communities. Hi, everyone. As Commander Glover mentioned, examples of teamwork and collaboration can be found in many different places. In art, we can find examples of cooperation, collective action, and community building. Artists' work has shaped the way we think about working together and has helped us create new definitions of teamwork. We are going to look at one visual artist whose artistry and love of color can help us think creatively about working together and supporting one another. Alma Thomas was an abstract artist from Washington, D.C. She created art during the 1960s and 70s. Thomas's deep knowledge of the elements of art inspired her to explore the relationship between light and color in her works. When we look at something like a beautiful painting, we are seeing light reflected off the surface of the canvas. Our eyes detect the reflected light and our brain interprets the signals from our eyes to help us see all of the hues in that work of art. Her paintings highlight the beauty and variety among different shades of colors. When painting, Thomas tried to share not only what she saw, but how she felt. Her colorful canvases captured her impressions and experiences of the scene in front of her. Alma Thomas's paintings place many different squares of color next to each other to create one striking image. Alone, these patches of color do not tell us much, but when surrounded by different hues, each patch of color contributes to a beautiful, unexpected story. The beauty of her work lies in these surprising color combinations. Each block of color brings its unique hue to the painting while amplifying and supporting the other blocks of color around it. A detail of this painting might look jumbled or confusing, but if we step back to look at the whole picture, 
we realize that many different colors are working together to create one stunning work of art. Looking at Alma Thomas's art through the lens of teamwork can help us think about the importance of diversity and inclusion when thinking about our own communities. Whether it is a team of space explorers from the US, Japan, and Russia flying 240 miles above the earth, or a rainbow of colors working together on the page in front of you, teamwork is essential for us to create new opportunities and experiences. What does teamwork look like to you? How can you use your art to express values of community and collaboration? Looking at, talking about, and creating art can help us express ourselves and learn more about each other. Through art, we can strengthen our communities and become a better teammate to those around us. So get your art supplies. Use crayons, markers, paint, or even your computer to show us what teamwork looks like in your lives. If you would like, once you have finished your artwork, share them with us by sending them to the email address nmaahc-stem at si.edu. However, before you submit a copy of your artwork, be sure to get permission from your parent or guardian first. The National Museum of African American History and Culture will regularly share student artworks on the Exploring Space with Commander Victor Glover webpage. It will take all of us exploring, learning, and sharing to create a brighter future for humanity. We have got a ton of schools tuning in today, including Lyles Crouch Traditional Academy, Providence Elementary School, Go Panthers, Sally B. Howard School, and Horace Mann Elementary School. Thank you all for watching. We are getting close to the start of the downlink. In just a few minutes, we'll be heading over to Mission Control. Scientists, engineers, communication specialists at Mission Control serve as teammates to the astronauts aboard the ISS. The team at Mission Control are frequently in contact with those aboard the ISS to ensure that everyone is safe and on task. What an awesome job to have. Victor's talked a lot about all of the teamwork that goes into living and working on the International Space Station. But there's a lot of teamwork and practice that goes in before you even get there. In fact, astronauts have to practice for spacewalks in a giant swimming pool at the Johnson Space Flight Center. There are divers that they work with in the pool. They keep them safe and put them in the correct positions. There are people watching them on cameras. There are other astronauts training them. So there's a lot of work that goes into training before you even leave the Earth we got a chance to talk to Victor about what that training looks like. I'm joined by NASA astronaut and Naval aviator, Victor Glover. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Yeah, glad to be here, Maury. You guys do a lot of training, particularly training underwater for walking in space. Mm -hmm. What is that training like? Oh, it's amazing. Um, you've got lots of people there to make sure that things are done safely. To put those two people in the suits, you may have 25 to 30 people there. And to put that on, you're really wearing a spacecraft. When you're outside of the space station, you're in a, a personalized spacecraft. And putting that on can, uh, can require the help of the teammates. So there's a lot of folks there to help make sure that uh, things are done safely. Uh, and then we get to you go to work. You start to train to repair things, to use the tools, and to work together and to communicate with your teammates. It's, it's amazing training. Wow. Do you guys ever use virtual reality to train for spacewalks? Absolutely. We have a virtual reality lab where they have a system of pulleys and gears and, and uh, mechanisms set up that you put the virtual reality glasses on in your gloves, and they can grab the handles from something. We call them uh, the, the machines, the boxes, and you hold on to those, and the machine will simulate what something feels like in microgravity. So I can hold on to a 1700 pound pump module and hold those handles and I can hold it by myself. But then if I move a little bit, I can feel what it's like to stop that mass. Cause even in microgravity, things still have mass. So starting and stopping them from moving can be a little unnerving. And we get to sense that using virtual reality, you can see your hands holding the box and feel the weight. Wow, it's pretty amazing. Do you ever train for the really mundane things, eating, taking a shower, going to the bathroom? Do you have to train for that? Uh, well, there's no shower. So that you don't train, you don't have to actually train for that one. You wipe down uh, and then you go to work. The crew of the space station, the International Space Station, has six people on it optimally, nominally. And with those six people, you have to be able to perform all of the science. You have to be able to do the spacewalks to keep the station running. You have to be able to uh, work together and they support public affairs events. They uh, do the maintenance when something breaks, when the toilet breaks, they're the ones that fix it. So you have to be competent in all of those things. Crew members that are experienced talk to us new guys and let us know what things are really like and give us some things to choose from so we understand what it's like. Is that an important part of the training is talking to people that have been there and done that? Absolutely. 
you know, the folks that train us, they've got the great degrees, they've been at NASA for a very long time, but there's only a small cadre of folks that have actually been there and taken all of that training and put it into practice. And so that's the folks that have been in our office for a while. And so we, we lean very heavily on their experience. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us <laughs> My today. pleasure, Marty. Well, you look at the time, the downlink is about to start. But before it does, here are some fun facts about the International Space Station. The International Space Station is traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, 240 miles above the Earth in low Earth orbit. This is Christopher Williams with the National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. How do you hear me? Chris, it's great to hear you. I have you loud and clear. I'm ready for the event. Awesome. We are really excited to be speaking with you today. How's your mission been so far? It's been amazing and it's hard to put into words how awesome it is to be up here. There's so much great work going on, such a great crew with my six colleagues and um, all of the support, knowing that you guys are down there cheering us on. It's just been phenomenal. Hi, Victor, it's Beth. I wanted to know if you could tell us about the science that's being done on the station right now. Beth, that is a great question. There are so many experiments going on at any one time. When I first got here, I was fortunate to participate in, in science projects that are uh, research projects that are looking at the effects of microgravity on our ability to sense and perceive orientation and, and our uh, motor skills. Um, there are also payloads outside that are running around the clock that are uh, sensing our atmosphere, that are looking at uh, different places on the planet, uh, as well as taking imagery, multi-spectral imagery of, of our, our planet. And, uh, and there's a whole host of other things, as well as the basic human research that is going on on us all of the time to find out how we can continue to be more efficient and effective while we work and live in space safely. Great question. Victor, this is Marty. We've got a bunch of pre-taped student questions from kids around the country. Here is your first question. Hi, my name is Violet from Cartersville, Georgia. And my question is, we all loved watching Baby Yoda make an entrance on the International Space Station. Why was he along for the trip? So that's a great question. We, we have a tradition of bringing along something in the spacecraft that we can use to visually tell when we're in microgravity. Because we're strapped into our seat so tight in order to keep us safe for launch loads, we have something that can give us the sensation that we're in microgravity because it floats. And so we brought along the child, the character, uh, that everybody refers to as Baby Yoda in order to, to let us know when we were experiencing microgravity. And if you were able to see our launch, you could tell that we all were well aware when we, uh, when we got into space on orbit. Hi, I'm Kate from South Riding, Virginia. And my question is, do you play with your food in space? Kate, that is a great question because I always play with my food in space. It's hard not to. You have to think about your food because it's also really easy to lose track of it and let some go floating off away. So you have to be careful to not make a mess, but it's so much fun to eat in space. And so I try to play with my food at every meal. Hi, I'm Bella from Fort Orange, California. And my question is, what are the colors like when you look out the window at Earth? 
Oh, that's uh, another great question. The colors are so rich and so beautiful because you're seeing it the way that it really is. The color of the ocean, when you're far away from the coast, it's just, it seems to be a different blue. They're just so rich, there's so much detail. It, it really is different than any picture or video that I've seen to see it with your own eyes and just a thin pane of glass between you and, and outside. It's amazing. I think you should get up here and see it for yourself. Hi, my name is Lila and I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. My question is, do you have to be in the military to become an astronaut? That is a great question, and I think you probably uh, study your history. The, the Mercury astronauts in the beginning, they were all military test pilots. But nowadays, if you look at our crew, it's a great representation. Two of us are military, and two of us are, are uh, academic and engineers uh, and scientists, and, and that is how our office is, is staffed nowadays. You do not have to be military. Uh, you just have to have a master's degree in science, engineering, or mathematics, uh, or equivalent work experience. Hi, my name is Sarah from Houston, Texas. My question is, what advice would you give to young students, specifically African Americans, who aspire to be in your position as a pilot and as a NASA astronaut? Thank you. Thank you. And actually, that advice, I try to keep it to these three simple things. No matter what you want to be, they will help you find success. And it's to be resilient, to not let things stop you. And even in bad situations, to help you find some positive, some good, some growth. Be resilient. That's number one. Number two, to be a lifelong learner inside the classroom and outside the classroom. There's so many things that you can learn all of the time. And the third one is to be a good teammate. Teamwork is so important in American society as a human being, and it also is important in science and technology and up here on the space station. Thank you for that question. Hi, I'm Bryce from Fairfax, Virginia, and I was wondering, what do you wear under your spacesuit? Well, it depends on what kind of spacesuit we're talking about. So under this suit, I have on just standard underclothing. Under our launch and entry suits, the, the other white suit that we wore up on our Crew Dragon Resilience, we had on long undergarments. And in our spacesuit that we go outside to do spacewalks in, we actually have on a similar long garment. But on top of that, we have something called the liquid cooling and ventilation garment, which has water running through it to keep us cool. And and air moving through to, to keep our, our, our skin dry and to keep us comfortable? Really good question. Hi, my name is Reese. I live in Lowell, Maryland. My question is, how do you stay in touch with your family while on the International Space Station? I lost a part of that, and I think you were asking how I keep in touch with family while I'm on the space station. We have computers that we can send emails, and people can send emails to us. We also have an internet-based phone system, and so I can make phone calls. In fact, right before this event, I called my wife to, to have her give me a pep talk because I was a little nervous, and she reminded me that anything you do that's important, it means you recognize that the importance of what you're getting ready to do, and so that's totally normal. Uh, and so it's really amazing how easy it is for us to keep in touch with our families from the International Space Station. Hello, my name is Charlie Moran. I'm from Annapolis, Maryland. I wanted to know what it's like floating and working in space. Well, working in space is very busy. There is a lot of work between science, the basic upkeep and maintenance of the space station, uh, as well as we live here. So we have to keep it clean. This is where we eat. And we also spend time socializing with one another. Floating on the space station is great. But again, it uh, is something you have to pay attention to, like eating, because uh, we have a saying in aviation, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And I've been trying to do that, but Sometimes I get going with a little bit of speed and it, it can be hard to stop. So I've bumped into quite a few things, but I'm working on it. I'm practicing, but it's great. 
Floating in space is really awesome. My name is Sianya Brown. I'm from Philadelphia, VA. My question is, when you get back to Earth, how long does it take before you can walk? That is a great question. And since this is my first time flying in space, I'm hoping that it's going to be very quick. Uh, well, you may have seen Bob and Doug on the first Crew Dragon mission. They flew home, and that same day they walked off the airplane and uh, and actually sat through a press conference. So I really hope that I can fly home from launch in that same day, walk off that airplane. That's going to be my goal, that same day that we land, to be able to walk. Good question. Hi, my name is Felix, and I'm from Stuttgart, Germany. My question is, how important is teamwork to being an astronaut? Wow. I could spend this whole time talking about the importance of teamwork. It is absolutely vital. From the four of us that flew up on our Crew Dragon training during a pandemic, it was very evident how important it was for us to think about and take care of one another. We had to live together and eat together uh, because of some of the restrictions due to training in a pandemic. And that continued when we got up here to the International Space Station. Sergey, Kate, and Sergey welcomed us and helped us to get started so that we could hit the ground running and start getting our hands in on all that work that was being done. And we also have a team all over the planet that has helped to train us and they also help us to operate this space station. And they're all over the world. And, and it's, in, it's vital for us to, to make sure that we work together. And also, like I mentioned earlier, I called my wife prior to this event. We also have that very important team that we call family. And so they are vital to, to accomplishing this successfully. Their love and support are what make this possible for me. Hi, I'm Tammy Adams, principal of Horace Mann Elementary School in Oakland, California. And we want to know, how long did you study before going into space? Well, let's see. I'm 44, so I would say 44 years. And actually still counting because there's always something to learn. Like I said earlier, number two is being a lifelong learner. And this job, the one constant is that you're going to always have to learn something. As spacecraft technology changes, scientific instrumentation changes, or just the configuration of our space station changes, there's always something to learn. We may be getting ready to go on a spacewalk very soon or getting a bunch of new science and, and other equipment on the SpaceX cargo dragon that's coming up. And both of those things are going to be something that I'm going to have to spend some time studying for and already have been studying for. Hi, my name is Soraya Ponder and I am from Kanye, Georgia. And my question is, what's water like in space and where does it go? Water in space is pretty amazing. It almost seems as if it's living. Now, our air conditioning system doesn't just control temperature, it controls humidity. And so it can pull in any moisture and then put it into a system that cleans it and makes it able for us to drink. But watch this, this is my water bag and I'm going to let a little bit of water out. And you see, if I was to do that on earth, it would make a bigger mess than I'm making right now. But you see that droplet that's just floating there. I can drink it right out of the air without it falling on the ground. It's pretty amazing. Like I said, I always play with my food up here. Hi, I'm Sadie from Fairfax, Virginia. And I was wondering, do you celebrate holidays in space? Yes, we do. Just like your family may celebrate certain holidays or you get certain ones off of school or work and then other ones you may have to go to school or work for, we get certain holidays off. And like your family, there are certain holidays you may celebrate and certain ones that you may not, but somebody else's family might celebrate. Our family up here is international. Right now our crew represents the United States, 
Russia, and Japan. And so we celebrate holidays from all different parts of the world. My name is Christian from Fort Irwin, California. And my question is, do you dream in space? You know, if you're talking about when you fall asleep, do I dream? I absolutely have dreams. Sleeping up here is great. It's so comfortable to, to sleep in this nice, relaxed position that uh, your body takes when you get into your sleeping bag. But you know what? I also dream when I'm awake. I stare out that cupola window at our beautiful planet and imagine being in some of the places I've never actually set foot on, but being able to fly overhead. I, I am sitting in that window or those windows and daydreaming I wish it was all day long, but for a good portion of the day. So even when I'm awake, I'm up here dreaming as well. Hi, my name is Anya. I am from South Riding, Virginia. And my question is, where is the International Space Station right now? How fast does it travel? How high up are you and what are you over right now? So the space station is actually passing over the Gulf of Mexico and very soon we're going to cross over Florida and fly up the East Coast right over the Smithsonian Museums, right over Washington, D.C. The space station is at an altitude of about 250 miles and our speed is 17,500 miles an hour. And that allows us to circle the globe once every 90 minutes or so. My name is Bill Williams. I'm a third grader at Sally B. Howard School, and my question is, how many challenges did you face with the Africa? Is it possible to repeat that question? I couldn't understand uh, what that question was. What are some challenges you face becoming an astronaut? Oh, I'm really glad I asked you to repeat that one. You know, becoming an astronaut, I would say it took me my whole life getting up to that point. The education, the athletics, the family support, the church, and all the work in the community. And the greatest challenges for me becoming an astronaut were the moving that I did with my family as a military family. We moved from place to place and it sometimes meant leaving the people that you loved. And even in this job now, we have to leave home for long periods of time and, and spend time away from the people and the things that we love. And so it's important, again, that first team, that family, to have a, a, a great relationship and a great bond so that you can pick up where you left off when you get back. But for us, our family has been, uh, it's been moving a lot on the way to becoming an astronaut. Hi, my name is Andres Jacobson. I live in Alexandria, Virginia. My question is, do your muscles act different in space? Do they act different? That's a great question because even though our muscles are still essentially doing the same thing, they're contracting and relaxing to help us move, the movements are very different. Because I don't actually have to hold up my own body weight, it makes it a little more challenging for me to figure out how I move. The way that you pivot and rotate is, is very different than when you have to balance your weight. So our muscles are doing the same thing. It's just that everything else around us is doing something different. It's all floating in microgravity. And so you have to learn how to move. I, I tell people joking all the time, I feel like a toddler. I understand what I want to get done, but it's a lot harder to do it. And I have to relearn how to move around and how to eat and how to communicate effectively up here. It's really interesting. Hi, my name is Simragi. I am from Chantilly, Virginia. And my question is, how do you keep yourself clean and healthy in space? 
to stay clean and healthy in space, you have to do it very carefully, just like everything else. You know, with the pandemic going on right now, we talk a lot about hygiene and how important it is to, to keep yourself clean and to keep the things around you, your environment clean. And that's true up here. It's actually very clean up here. And, and because of that, we try very hard to keep it that way and to also keep ourselves clean. But we have hot water and soap and, and the ability to do hygiene up here just like you do on the ground, except we don't have a easy access to, say, a, a shower or a bathtub, as that wouldn't work in microgravity. So we have to find ways to improvise and use the surface tension of water, for example. If I had taken that droplet of water and just stuck it to my head, it would stay there because it's attracted to the surface of my skin. And I can then put a little bit of soap there and I can rub it in and then wipe it off with a towel to clean or I can shave to cut my hair. Victor, thank you so much for talking with us today and answering all of these questions. We hope you have a great mission and we look forward to seeing you at the Smithsonian when you get back to Earth. It's been great talking to you, and it's been a while, but it's great to talk to both of you, and I look forward to it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you to the kids out there. Continue to take care of yourselves and take care of one another, and let's explore together. Station that was Houston amazing. That I will you. take this as an early birthday gift to myself. And just like Victor has talked about the importance of teamwork, bringing you this downlink today took a huge team. Every single person on our team and the team at NASA played an important role and there were no small roles. We wanna thank everybody on our team for making this happen today. We also wanna thank all of you for watching and to all of the teachers out there, thank you so much for inspiring that next generation of explorers. All of us are parts of different teams. Your class. Your school. Your community. What teams are you a part of and what did you learn today that will make you a better teammate? Let us know about that in the comments section. And like Victor said, let's keep exploring together. Thanks for watching, folks.